opinions loudly or quietly. Autonomy is an illusion. Pull over our eyes and shove down our throats. Hello and welcome to episode 31 of Africanists Assemble. On this podcast, we ask our contributors a new question every month in an attempt to contribute to the recalibration of the studies of African literatures and languages. In this month's episode, we turn things around and ask our contributors to come up with questions they think of as especially relevant. We asked... What is a question that hasn't been posed in this format before that you think is crucial to recalibrating the study of African languages, literatures and studies? Why do you find that question so important? Let's hear their questions and thoughts. Venho de uma perspectiva externa às línguas e literaturas africanas. Tenho alguma experiência com estudos africanos que construí principalmente durante os anos da minha estadia académica em Lisboa. Quando me mudei para a Universidade de Bayreuth, fui colocada num departamento onde os meus colegas falam habitualmente mais do que uma língua africana. Isto é muito novo para mim. Abordei os estudos africanos a partir da ciência e da teoria política, das relações internacionais e de forma marginal a partir da antropologia. A paisagem linguística está aqui completamente ausente. Penso que é esta questão que quero colocar. Como é que as línguas africanas e os estudos destas são úteis nos estudos africanos em interdisciplinariedade? Ou melhor, como podemos utilizar as línguas africanas noutras disciplinas relacionadas com o um estudo sobre o continente? Em teoria e na ciência política, por exemplo, muito se diz sobre a forma como os cânones destas disciplinas rotineiramente apresentam a África como uma exceção, ou como um caso peculiar que difere, entre outros, do liberalismo ocidental. No entanto, toda a literatura continua a perpetuar esta leitura através de análises em inglês, em menor escala em francês e em menor escala ainda em português. O papel das línguas africanas na transmissão de conhecimento, construção de poder e da política é subestimado ou ignorado. Assim, a minha pergunta é, o que podemos aprender se olharmos para a interseção das línguas africanas numa perspectiva interdisciplinar, juntamente com outras disciplinas. O que, pode, o que podem as outras disciplinas aprender com a revitalização das línguas e a recalibração dos estudos africanos? But I think that question is what indigenous symbolic or interpretive code or principle could be used in interpreting African literature And what text is it particularly fit for application? A symbolic or interpretive code is a minimum linguistic unit that unlocks meanings when applied to a literary text. It could be in form of a maxim, say a proverb or metaphor or a catchy phrase and so on. When this is adopted from the lore of a people and applied to any narrative produced by these people, it opens up a whole lot of issues that ordinarily would have been glossed over if Western critical narratives or critical terms, concepts were applied. So when they question what indigenous symbolic or interpretive codes or principle could be applied in interpreting African literature and what text is, it is particularly fit for application is posed, It provokes interesting discussions about the reading of African literature. So the follow-up question then is, why does it matter? 
In my many years of reading African literature, uh, I discovered that deploying Western critical lenses to interpret African literary texts does not wholly uncover the meanings of a text. Texts particularly notorious for this are those I have termed first-generation African literary works. That is because they contain surplus African cosmological elements which weigh in on the destiny of characters and uh, which cannot be wholly unveiled via un-African critical tools. Uh, I will cite an example. Let's take J.P. Clark's tragic play, Song of a Goat. Applying Western critical concept of tragedy or Western concept of tragedy to this work, we will find that it actually would yield nothing since Zipha, the major character, the tragic hero in this text, is neither a leader of men nor a highly placed person in the community. At best, the song of a goat could be read as depicting the extreme anger of a man who was unable to make his wife pregnant or one who got so depressed that his brother was sleeping with his wife and has made her pregnant where he has always failed, that he takes his life. But looking closely at the events of the work and drawing on the cosmological tragedy of a man's failing manhood, the interpretation, if you apply this cosmological tragedy of a man's failing manhood to this work, the interpretation of the work gets interesting. The work quickly assumes the dimension of an African tragedy of huge significance. It is the above sort of digging deep into African cosmological codes that I think will help revitalize the reading of both previous and contemporary African literatures. Adjujo abanke ili atonu sere. Keda judo ana ajubegi no dia nki chere dio kenpa ni kwalita asusu na agumago Africa. Gini mere jere hota ajujo de kanke dio kenpa. Ajujo mbo, kedi hi mene ndi nkuzi asusu na agumago Africa. Nogu la kukwa ni ili, no mwa kukwa ha, ji, hana ge mwike mwata ego nchocha. Mba mwere tandi oru. O hira agma akukwa neyefu. Oro, ni hindi ozoga. De kandi obo ha, nangalaba di uchiche. O katande science. Ozo kwa, gini meno tutundi ne nana. Anage akwa do omu ha. Esu asusu obodo ha. Maya fwoziye emu. Nego ya, no la akukwa di elu. Inye mene mje honta ajujua. De kanke di oke nkwa. Bo makana udo ni idi nutu. Ngulite na ntolita akonoba. Nkano ozo na wangwa tota utukuru. Nkano susu no mena lamba. Hiweri sinezi bonkuzi asusu na agomago mba. Nde uni. I would think or would suggest we move into more of African languages. African literatures and studies and security, the area of security, national security, you know, especially how terrorism has bedeviled Africa. We could also see um, the area of national development, African uh, literatures, African language and studies, and national development. You know, how African languages African studies, African literature can, you know, assist or can help in the development of economies of the continent. It can project in that area because colonialism has brought us, you know, uh, language and uh, for me, a lot of separation. We need to go back to the root to see how what binds us as Africans, the language that binds us, the language that keeps us as one, is re-engineered, reinvented to meet the world emerging trends and standards so that uh, we can project our peculiarities and cultures for national development. This is what I'll say. 
if we could look at these areas and also gender african languages african literatures and gender especially african languages and gender we have looked at uh, literatures on gender but um, in other aspects not uh, but we could also you know project that in africanist assemble i think it will be quite interesting for us to do that Well, a question that hasn't been posed so far and that in my opinion is fundamental to recalibrating the study of African languages, literatures and studies has to do with power relations. I would like someone to ask, what is the role of global power structures in the study of African languages, literatures and studies? And how can we fill in the gap between intellectual thought and cultural and social practices in a way that can generate concrete changes in our societies? Uh, I would say to me, this is a crucial question that can generate many fruitful debates. It is true that we might not all agree on the answers and solutions, but those are questions that is worth raising. Also remembering that the way in which we pose questions has a direct influence on the way we produce knowledge. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Um, in media studies, it is always said that um, you understand communication better when it breaks down. Well, the, the question, first and foremost, is right under my nose, and it's, it's asking students who are not in African languages class or in literature or in the studies of the economics and politics and way of life of Africans, the question to ask them is, why are you not in that class? Why don't you come to our class? Maybe when we understand why those who do not come to the classes, we probably might have a better understanding of those who are already in the classes. So there's no need really preaching to the choir. It is a question that I've always wanted to pose, to ask why are some of the anthropologists that go to Africa not bother about learning the language? The answer to them is simple, that most places they go to, they can find somebody who speaks English. Well, speaking an African language is just the beginning of your understanding of what you have gone there to find out. Encoded in the language is a worldview. Encoded in the language is a culture. Encoded in the language are answers to questions that you do not need to ask, but will come out through the language. Now, oh, I would use translation. There are some words and ideas that are not translatable, and they get lost in translation, in fact. There's nothing as good as being in a research location and understanding what is going on around you. Uh, not waiting until you get back to your station to start the question of translation. So for me, the, the question would always be, why? Why are you not registering in our classes? Why are you not trying to understand history in a fictionalized way in the literature classes? Because, yeah, basically what you read in African literature, and in most literature, by the way, is an understanding of society using the lens of a writer and hiding sometimes behind historical facts, but fictionalized. And it gives a, a doorway to understanding sometimes what you see. A topic that has not been touched upon or a more kind of a question, I have the feeling that the topic of memory as a field has not been appropriately addressed. Additionally, what triggers me most now is the question of archives. How do we deal with an archive? What actually constitutes an archive, especially within an African context, and what are its limitations? How do we read, interact, and converse with an archive as both an outsider and an insider? There is also uh, the danger of producing questionable knowledges, uh, for instance. I believe the notion of archive has expanded beyond merely referring to pre-coronial or 
colonial document to include other forms of archiving. The problem I have lies in the metaf metaphoric interpretations of archive and their temporalities. Perhaps through interdisciplinary dialogue here, we can reflect on how um, we address the archive and also sharing our experiences from and within it while re remaining faithful to our disciplines. I want to suggest the following two questions which have not been asked. I have a first question about the so-called grassroots or organic intellectuals. Can you introduce a local African expert of language or literature who has not studied at a university but is considered knowledgeable by his or her community and or has helped you with your own research? This question is highly relevant from my point of view because often the so-called informants Africanists work with are hardly mentioned or only figure in footnotes. I have had incredibly enriching encounters with men and women from local communities who took the time to explain their language, poetry and cultures to me. Ahmed Shahnabahani, for instance, who learned to compose poetry from his grandmother, did research on poetic traditions, the vocabulary of local crafts himself, and he became a walking dictionary, as the philologist J.W.T. Allen once called him. Possibly also in addition to that question, could you invite such a local expert to contribute to Africanist Assemble? I have a second set of questions um, that these questions are for students of African languages and literatures. Why do you study African languages and literatures? And how would a perfect study program of African languages and literatures look like, both in terms of form and content? The reason I'm suggesting this question is that me being a teacher in two study programs of African verbal and visual arts, I'm always curious to learn about new methods, ways other colleagues teach and students imagine study programs to look like. I'm particularly eager to learn from students since there's always a kind of a generational gap. Professors devise study programs in relation to their previous studies, both defining what they think students need, but also imagining what students want to see in the program. Whereas I think I'm curious to learn from the students what they think is needed and what they want to see in the program. Thank you. O si da ki ero yi wa si mi lokan pe won ko ti bere bere yi ni abala eko ede ati literature africa to se pataki nipa atunse eko ede africa ibere na ni pe bi o ko ba so ede abini bi re mo kini o padanu won le ro pe o ye ki a je ki amu amo nipa ewu to wa ninu aiso ede abini bi sara ede lo bi asadogun ba wa laruke Oh no, Shafion, I shall wa. A senior on a conscious show, see a shat in Shafin Boru. What on that can one more lay where a lack of bearing more with that da, be a baffy, there be any bishala yako, no Shafon. Be any of Bacon at the saw, a there be any beery. Any of your padano, I may Danny Mori. Magba, I won't be me your do, can one jacky and one more walk bo, can one silly so a there be any be da. Ki won le ni idani mo. Asha dogu ba ati yi toro mo e de abini bi. Ki won le ni idani mo. Asha dogu ba ati yi toro mo e de abini bi. Oya ki e agbe e de abini bi wala ruge ni tori. O ni gbongbo idani mo wa. Agba lo gba ba oro mini pe. Bi o ba kola ti so e de abini bi ire. O kwa da no idani mo re. Ire o e shi on. One of the questions that I think RECAV could consider relates to the use of theoretical framework in the study of African languages and literatures. I may not be able to aptly capture this concern in form of a single question, but I think there is a need to interrogate 
the use of theoretical framework in the explanation and analysis of a subject matter that deserves scholarly attention in African studies. This actually stems from a personal observation. Some of the recurring comments students get from examiners during presentation, presentations of their works relate to their theoretical frameworks. The queries include the appropriateness of the theoretical framework to their works, the need inadequacies of the theoretical framework to cover their works, or even their inability to effectively apply the theoretical framework in their analysis, and some other questions that relate to their theory. Most of the time, I've also observed that students opt to use theoretical frameworks proposed by scholars who are working outside their context. And in the end, they are not able to adequately apply their theoretical framework in their works. Well, this raises some questions in my mind. And some of the questions include, should all research works in African languages and literatures be subjected to the use of theoretical frameworks? How important is the use of theoretical framework in research and knowledge production in African studies? Can a theoretical framework developed outside African context adequately be used to analyze and account for phenomena in Africa? If yes, how should it be applied to fit into the context? Can scholars in African studies always think of developing a theoretical framework or even a model that fits into their context? These are some of the questions that come to my mind whenever students are queried over the use of theoretical framework. Cari editori del podcast, grazie per la vostra sollecitazione. Tra le domande scomode e utili a riconsiderare criticamente l'ambito degli studi sulle lingue e letterature africane, ma in generale direi tutto il settore della ricerca umanistica, me ne viene in mente una che mi pongo spesso prima di accingermi a scrivere un articolo o un saggio accademico, ed è la seguente. Ma perché dobbiamo adeguarci in tutto e per tutto a una modalità così standardizzata della scrittura accademica che, inseguendo il parametro della cosiddetta scientificità, reprime l'espressione dell'opinione personale, è abolito l'io e siamo schiavi dell'ipse dixit e della soggettività, nonché la riflessione sulla nostra relazione cognitiva, emozionale, fisica, esperienziale con le lingue e letterature che ci interessano. Ora, persistendo sempre in questo territorio di mezzo, pavido e anonimo, non ci stiamo condannando irrimediabilmente alla mediocrità e all'irrilevanza. Il verbo ricalibrare in senso non figurato indica l'operazione di correggere strumenti di misura consumati, non più esatti. Vi è dunque associata l'idea di ripristinare un equilibrio perduto. Ecco, mi pare che l'equilibrio che si sia perso nel mondo degli studi umanistici universitari sia quello tra la relazione personale alla ricerca, poiché ricerchiamo con tutta la nostra persona e conosciamo anche noi stessi attraverso testi e contesti, e la nostra rappresentazione in termini impersonali e spesso atrofici di questo processo. Credo che questa sia una questione rilevante, perché il modo in cui scriviamo della ricerca inevitabilmente influenza anche la nostra elaborazione teorica, gli approcci metodologici, forse, sarebbe ora di mettere in discussione e scompaginare questi modelli che di fatto normano la produzione delle pubblicazioni accademiche. One question that I think is crucial to recalibrating Africanistic study on this platform is the question that has to do with um, phonings, consonants, and vowel sounds. I think this question is very important because it helps to promote uh, literacy. Apart from speaking, it helps to one to know how to also read and write in one's language. 
So some of the questions could come from what constitutes the phonemes, how does it even differ from other Western um, phonemes, consonants and, and vowel sounds? My question is on literary content and African names as histopoetics. Therefore, my question is on why is there no extraction of the literary content in African names as histopoetics? African names before the era of reading and writing, that is pre-colonial era, were used for histopoetical purposes. This implies that it has the historical parts of the people's culture and the literary parts. Although the study of names is known as onomastics, to what extent has the literary content of the extensive oral literature of African names be distilled from it through literary approach? For instance, names as Okuimbose in Benin simply means war is not beautiful. This name, though sounds warning, it also indicates that there was war intent either in the family, community, town, or nation. Another name that is relevant in such order is Amadin, which is an abbreviation of Amadin Ainye Agbon, meaning if you are not shrewd, you cannot live life. Apart from these names being poetical, a careful study will throw up the literary content endemic in them. It is therefore important to examine these names that were given at pre-reading and writing period with intent to spy into their histopoetical past. Thank you. The importance of the recalibrating of the study of African languages, the recent study, is that how are we going to move forward to do further introspection into how do a Hovas or a language, how does its dialect or dialect sentences be incorporated to into each other so that a language, because a language, it loves on, it has its longevity, According to dialects, but we must also remember that in the Hovas or language there is her own main umbrella that accommodates all language dialects that needs to love on because if you go into a certain in African languages, we all know that not in the same area or different areas we will get the same dialect. You go and you will get a different dialect. So, that is for me the most important part that hasn't been posed in the cruciality of this, even also in studies and literature. literature. How do we to evolve and further broaden the horizons on the spectrum of literature, oral stories that has been pinned down in the Hovas or language? How does that, apart from preservation in university archives, how is it accessible for the public and even in literature and studies, how will it be further? Will it just be for higher education or will primary and high schools? How will they also be included in the language and the literature and studies that needs to be enhanced for further studies, further knowledgeable and transparency according to all language and her own set of standards that has been set out to say this and that will be done for the language, so how will this be further going forward into future tenses? Thank you. One of the questions that I have found interesting since the beginning of this postcard had been that which requires us to design a department for a new university. Uh, I think that question helps us to appreciate the changing nature of our world and our realities. And 
Um, if literature is the reflection of the society, and we know what has happened in our recent in our society in recent times, um, we need uh, courses that would respond to those dynamics, those changes in the society. I think I proposed uh, a department of African languages and literature. It existed, right? But my answer was trying to look at it from a different perspective, which is that um, there should be a direct relationship between African languages and uh, all other languages situated in the same unit so that there would be it would be much more easier for a cross pollination of ideas and it will also give um, polyglots or those who are interested in the study or history of language to walk around whatever they think they would want to investigate without much hustle if we have a department that has a um, um, like a school of languages, right? If we have such thing, um, it will be much more easier for people who are interested in, say, for example, the development of a particular language, its history, the relationship of languages, um, their collaborations. Uh, all of these things would be easier accessed if everything is situated within a confined environment. So my proposal was um, to look at um, the study of African languages and literature from a perspective where we are we can easily access information. And so if we have a department that accommodates the various languages, the various literature in one unit, in one section or in one in one in one pool, it will be much more uh, easier. Challenging I know, um, big yes, but it is something that can be done. So why that is possible, why I appreciate such is because it will give us, like I said, the the opportunity to get so much with little effort. Yeah, so if a department has, um, for example, we have 20 languages situated in a particular department, we know how interesting that would be, how innovative that would be, getting to understand the evolution, development, relationships, similarities, differences of these languages without really having to break our head or break our neck. A question that has not been asked before that I think would be crucial to recalibrating Africanistic would be a question about the extant usage of mother tongues, especially in townships and urban communities, particularly by families, nuclear families. I think um, if certain research is undertaken in this direction, it could tell us the degree of um, language encroachment or loss of native tongues within urban settings. And then that kind of research could also prompt a way of um, finding solutions to it. In the same vein, there should be another question about ethnography in the digital space. I'm saying this because it looks as if the universal language of the internet is English language. and Rarely do we use other languages and do we also encourage the use of other languages. I believe that if we care to study these African languages in the smallest units, it will go a long way to showcase its impact on a broad scale. So I think we can delve down to smaller units and on the project. It's just something that we have not really discussed before, uh, in my opinion, with my brief history in RECAF project, uh, because most times we we look at it from the sector of um, higher institutions. We do not really focus on the lower levels, so to speak, or lower units of the society. Uh, that's just my opinion about it, if we can look into that. There's something odd or tricky about this question. It conveys the impression that there's a finite number of questions that when asked and answered will yield the knowledge required to make sense of something. I'm not sure whether this is the case. Understanding is not premised on the answers we get to the questions we ask. Understanding is premised on the questions we can ask once we get partial or full answers, perhaps even wrong or correct answers, to the questions we ask. 
There's a sense in which we ask questions to be able to ask further questions. I advise those doing research, especially PhD and MA students, for instance, not to worry too much about the answer to their research question. Although, of course, I think this is important. Instead, they should concern themselves with the extent to which the answer or even the inability to answer their research question enables them to ask a bigger question. So this is another way of saying that a great answer does not kill our curiosity. It makes us even more curious. I hope I'm not dodging the question with logical slays of hand. In any case, my feeling is that the more relevant question here is a slightly different one. What questions can we now ask about recalibrating the study of African languages, literatures, and studies? And here my suggestion would be the following. How have the different contributions helped us acquire an understanding of this subject that is fundamentally different from the one we had when we started? My answer would probably go in the direction of assuming that African languages, literatures, and studies should not be thought of as entities with an essential quality. Rather, they are the fleeting outcome of the intellectual firepower we deploy to make sense of them. So the bigger question arising from this would then be the following. So what? These were all the contributions and questions we received for this episode. As we have heard, it's about the questions we ask as much as about the answers we might find. So what questions would you like to ask us next? Was there any particular question raised by one of our contributors you would like to answer? Leave us your thoughts in the comment section down below. If you don't want to miss out on any upcoming episodes of Africanists Assemble, don't forget to subscribe. And until next month. Human error is always the best